What a joy it is to see you here this morning. And um, didn't Brenda bless our lives? I'll tell you, um, we've been, my wife and I have been friends with the Kilpatricks uh, since 1983. And I can truthfully tell you that I've seen her grow during these years. We've all grown. We've all changed. And uh, we, we call the changes growth. I hope that's what it is. <laughs> anyway, um, what, a, what a joy it is to see her with confidence to stand before us and share her heart. You know, there are ingredients that are necessary in order to have a revival. You first of all have to have uh, God. You know, you can't schedule a revival. You can't schedule a revival any more than you can schedule a hurricane. Uh, revival is just something that God decides to do. Now, you can create an atmosphere will, which will attract God. And that's what happened here. There was an atmosphere. The reason hurricanes and tornadoes happen is because atmospheric conditions have been created in the heavens that uh, make it conducive for those things to occur. And revival is the same way. The atmosphere can be created so that God will be drawn there. And um, that's what happened here. And uh, there are ingredients uh, that are necessary. You have to have people that are hungry for revival, that are so not just hungry, but they're desperate, desperate for revival. And uh, one of the prayers that I pray now is for God to make the church desperate. I don't think the church as a whole is quite desperate yet, but we're going to get there. The, the atmosphere is going to be changed so that, and the situation, the environment's going to be changed so that we become absolutely uh, desperate. And the reason we're going to be desperate is, we're going to, is because we're going to see that we're destitute uh, because we don't have the resources to bring the supernatural to bear upon the world situation and upon the sinful condition of men's lives. And... Um, so that desperation is coming into the church. So you've got to have a congregation that's desperate. Uh, you've got to have a pastor uh, when that revival starts. Listen, revival is chaotic. Somebody asked Spurgeon one time to define revival. He said it's holy chaos. And that's what it is. If you think revival is going to be sweet and it's just going to be manageable and it's just going to be smooth sailing, uh, you, you don't want to get involved with a revival because revival is like being in the center of a tornado. And I, it's, it's unpredictable. Things happen that are beyond your control, thank God. <laughs> and, and things you wish you, control, you, can, can, you could control, you can't. And so you've got to have a pastor that can, can manage that situation through uh, those chaotic times. And, um, and, and we've had that here. And uh, then you've got to have an evangelist. And God was so gracious to send Steve Hill here. When Steve Hill, uh, when, when I came to the revival, as I told you yesterday, Pastor was laid out for about two weeks. And Steve Hill was running the show, and I'm telling you, it was a zoo, as far as I was concerned. Uh, Lendl Cooley had long hair at that time, you know, and I'm a military background guy. And he was standing up there with his eyes crossed, looking at the ceiling, banging that... Uh, uh, banging that uh, keyboard, writing songs, standing at the keyboard. It was driving me nuts. And Steve Hill's running all over the place with a microphone. He's yelling and screaming and spitting, running up in the balcony with a Bible and running. He'd go up this side and run people out that side. It was, it was absolutely chaos. It was crazy. And, um, uh, <laughs> but, but you got to have that. You, you got to have an evangelist. And, you know, uh, Steve Hill has the ability to pastor, but that's not his gift. I can tell you it's not his gift. Because I've come along and healed up a ton of people that he ran over like a Mack truck. <laughs> I mean, one, one night I walked, out, I walked down the hall. And I was on the platform and had to go back to the back for something. I walked down the hall, and people were standing there, and they were just stunned, and some of them were weeping. I said, what in the world's wrong? I said, Steve was in here, and he just chewed us out. So we were back here just fellowshipping a little bit. He came back, and he said, I'm out there fighting demons, and you're back here fellowshipping. And I said, well, that's just Steve, you know, and that's his gift. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. And I petted him a little bit, and, um, you know, <laughs> It, it, it's a hoot, I'm telling you. But 
I, I, I'm pointing out to you the necessity or the things, the ingredients you need for revival. And uh, an evangelist is what you need. You need a pastor. You need a congregation. You need an evangelist. And um, Larry Martin is an evangelist. Now, he has a doctorate. He's an educator. He's functioning in our school here, and thank God for him. He's a godsend. But really, Larry Martin is an evangelist. That's what he is. He's a gift. And um, if you feel like God's about to move into your, your situation, you got a great congregation, they're ready for revival, or you want to get them ready, and uh, you need an evangelist, this guy would be the guy. Uh, I, I can recommend him wholeheartedly. There are others in this room. Gary Richardson's back there. He's a great revivalist. And um, if, if you feel like that you want to take this risk, <laughs> then, uh, you know, see one of these guys and, um, and uh, get them involved and, and, and let's see what God will do. I believe the time is right. I believe it's the most appropriate time right now that we've ever seen in the history of the church. Someone came up to me yesterday after the, my presentation and said that they were in New York City recently and the, lead, the spiritual leadership there said the attendance after 911 skyrocketed in the churches but now it's lower than it was previous to 911. And when they, they began to do the survey to find out why people were attending church less after 911 than before, they said we went and the church had nothing for us. So revival is not something that we should desire or even want. Revival is absolutely necessary. It is an absolute requirement. And so uh, Larry Martin is a revivalist. And uh, Larry, I thank you for the books. You paid me adequately for saying all these nice things about you. And uh, so would you welcome Larry Martin, please. <laughs> chaplain I I don't think I could pay for a recommendation like that but thank you very much I want you to meet my wife TJ's with us today I love and appreciate her stand up honey I chuckled inside when sister Brenda was talking about how we preachers fish for compliments from our wives after we get through with service, ain't it the truth? <laughs> Heard the story about one guy that's on his way home after he's preached and he and his wife have had a little spat that morning and he hasn't done that well preaching and they're on their way home and he's fishing. Wanting a little compliment from her and he says, you know, honey, how many really great preachers do you think there are in the world? And she said, I think probably one less than you think there are. <laughs> Folks want to know the secret to this Brownsville revival. Pastor Robertson just said to you what I was going to say too. You've got to have a pastor with a heart for revival. And we have the greatest pastor in the world in John Kilpatrick. He's a man that is so real. I've seen him, before I moved to Brownsville, I was able to observe him from a distance since I've moved to Brownsville, I'm able to observe him close up. And he's just as real close up as he is from the distance. He is real. I've seen him in times in meetings, in big meetings, when he refused to take up an offering because it just didn't feel right, that pressure had been put on the people and he just wasn't going to allow that to happen. I've seen him protect this congregation from things passing through in this revival. And he is a real pastor, a real man of God. He's, uh, I, I told him one time he was my hero, and I think that, uh, I think it embarrassed him for me to say that. But, uh, you know, we need somebody in the church we can look up to. 
There's plenty of people in the church we can look down on. And Chaplain Robertson is one of the most selfless, loyal workers I've ever seen in my life. I don't know if it was his military background. I have a sense that has something to do with it. But I've never seen a man, a second in command, that was so loyal and so faithful to a man of God as Chaplain is to our pastor. And uh, this, this thing that you see here, I, I started to say this operation, I don't really know what to call it, but what you see here at Brownsville would not happen if it wasn't for the work of those two men of God who put their shoulder to the plow continuously. And uh, I just wanted to express appreciation to them this morning. I am so honored to be able to speak to you today. Some of you are probably wondering, who is this guy and where did he come from? I just want to tell you, uh, I thought while Pastor was preaching yesterday, I am truly the most blessed man in the world. I am truly the most blessed man in the world. Five years ago, God changed my life in revival. A little over five years ago, and about five years ago, a little more than that, I quit my job that I had at the time to go out on the evangelistic field because that's what God told me to do. And when I quit my job on April the 1st of 1997, I didn't have a single meeting booked, not one. I just, I just stepped out by faith. I planted my feet in midair. And that's not a bad place to be because once God planted his feet in midair because there was nowhere else to put them and made everything that is. I just planted my feet in midair and uh, said, okay, God, I'm trusting you. And God complicated the matter a little bit more. You see, I pastored for 21 years and I know what it's like to get calls, sometimes three or four a day, from people wanting to come to my church and preach. So God complicated the matter a little further for me and said, don't ask anybody for a place to preach. I'll open the doors for you. So we just stepped out by faith, trusting God, and God met our needs. Miraculously, the mill barrel was never empty. Sometimes we could see the bottom of it, but it was never empty. Anybody know what I'm talking about? God always supplied for us. Sometimes we'd close a meeting and we wouldn't have another thing booked. I'm not talking about next week. I'm talking about for the next hundred years. We wouldn't have anything booked. We were just trusting God and going hard after God. When God changed my life, I determined I wasn't going to go back to what I was. And we started going hard after God, seeking the Lord and and praying and fasting. One year I fasted almost as many days as I ate. I lost 65 pounds just seeking God and going after God and chasing revival. Anywhere there was revival, if we wasn't preaching revival, we were in revival almost every night, making multiple trips down here to Brownsville and everywhere. I think we heard pastor preach in eight different states, just going out hungry for God and hungry for revival, chasing the Lord, and something got God's attention. How many of you know the Bible says God is looking across the earth, hunting someone he can bless? God is searching for somebody in this room today that has a heart after him, somebody that he can pour his spirit into, somebody that he can bless. We begin to get different words of prophecy over and over, different words of prophecy. And one fellow said, I'll never forget, he said, God's going to do something and you're just going to say, wow. That's all it's going to be. You're just going to say, wow. Man, I tell you what, I'm saying, wow, this morning. We were in a meeting. We were in a meeting for eight months in South Carolina and we're preaching one night a week and preaching to a couple of hundred people. And on a Saturday night, the pastor of that church, man, I had a lot of confidence in spoke over me, he said, God gave him a word, and he said, God is going to raise your platform. 
that very Friday night following, we had made a plan to come to Brownsville. And we have always come and getting just soaking in the river. And we made a plan to come to Brownsville. And while we were here at the service, Pastor asked me to come and share something from the platform. And, and I shared that from the platform. And then after the service, it was one of those services where no one preached. And after the service, he said, give an altar call. So I went up and gave an altar call. And then we went out after the service, went over to Denny's. And after we had eaten... Our meal is like midnight or later, I guess much later, and we were standing out in the parking lot with Harlan and Drenda Stoner, and Drenda said, you gave the altar call at Brownsville tonight. And when she said that, I got weak in my knees. I could barely stand. I got so weak in my knees thinking about that. Not that I hadn't been before a bigger crowd or a larger group of people, but the awesomeness of this pulpit, I believe that Brownsville is the greatest pulpit in the world today for revival. Now, I believe that. And it just, man, it overwhelmed me. And two months later, pastor's calling, asked me to come and preach on a Sunday morning at Brownsville. And we moved to Brownsville the next week camping out in an apartment, sleeping on the floor for a while until we could move our stuff to help out with the school. And I just say I am the most blessed person in the world. God is a good God. I said God is a good God. And I think Pastor likes me. I don't know why. I'm telling you there are people who are better preachers Smarter than me, more spiritual than me, better than me. I'm just blessed by God, and I give him praise and glory today. Are you blessed by God? Why don't we just lift our hands and thank God for his blessings right now? Can we do that? Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your blessings, Lord. We praise your name, Lord. You're so good to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Let's turn to the book of Leviticus chapter 6. I'm not going to preach a long time this morning. I was planning to talk about Azusa Street and give my class on revival. And I began to feel God was speaking to me to preach a message that he'd given me on the fire of God, but I'd, I'd really felt like that I'd kind of made a commitment to do the Azusa Street thing, and, and uh, I wanted to call the conference department and ask them if it would be all right if I spoke on something else, and I didn't call them, but then they called me talking about the schedule, and they said, now, pastor said that he wants everybody just to preach whatever they feel led of God to preach, and I said, whoa, that's got to be God. I think I'm going to preach this. I'm going to give this teaching today instead of the other, but Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 19, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and of his sons, which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is anointed, the tenth part of an ephah, a fine flour for a meat offering, perpetual, half of it in the morning and half thereof at night, in a pan it shall be made with oil. And when it is baked, I'm on the wrong verse. What did I say? I'm reading, I ought to be reading verse 9. Let's try again. Boy, I'm telling you, you pastors know what I'm talking about. I knew that had nothing to do with what I was going to preach about this morning. Let's try that again. Boy, I feel better now. You have to know, you have to be a preacher to know what I'm feeling because I know I've got this written down here and I'm thinking I've written down the wrong thing and I will never find this text I'm supposed to read. Verse 9, let's try that again. Command Aaron and his sons saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. Whew, that sounds better. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. 
And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen breeches, shall he put upon his flesh and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, it shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Whoa. Can we say that together out loud, whatever translation you have, verse 13. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the privilege that is mine to share at this conference. Lord, I thank you for these pastors and leaders and spouses that are gathered here today to hear a fresh word from the Lord. Lord, I feel inadequate to the task that you've called me to, but I ask for your help right now. I ask for your anointing, Lord. I ask you, Lord, for the fire of God to burn among us today. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and change our lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. The title to my message this morning is How to Keep the Fire Burning. How to Keep the Fire Burning. When Abraham Lincoln was elected the second time as President of the United States, it was a much different circumstance than the first time he was elected. At his second election, the United States was in the turmoil of a great civil war. And Abraham Lincoln, giving his second inaugural address, said this, Our goal or purpose is not to prove that a union can be established. It is not our job to prove that a nation of the people, for the people, and by the people can be established, for we have proven that. We have established such a nation on the earth. But our job is to prove that such a union can be maintained. And I want to tell you something this morning, church leaders. Our job in the church of the Lord is not just to get a fire started. Our job before God is to keep the fire burning. Sometimes it's easy to start a fire, but it's more difficult to maintain the fire of God. At Azusa Street in 1906, when the glory of God fell on Bonnie Bray Street and then moved over to the mission on 312 Azusa, they advertised in their newspaper the apostolic faith how long will this revival continue? This revival will continue until Jesus comes. But it didn't. I said, but it didn't. The fire went out at Azusa Street. Now it burned in other places, but it went out at Azusa Street. They started the fire, but they didn't maintain the fire. And I can tell you, and many of you know from experience, dozens of people, Dozens of churches that the pastor, some leader has came to Brownsville and God has changed them and touched them and they've gone back to their assembly and the fire of God has fallen in their church sometimes in the most unexpected ways. The fire of God has shown up and, and God just made himself real to those people and yet today, years later or months later, the fire that once burned so bright is barely a flicker if it even burns at all. So the challenge for us in this room is not just to get a fire started. The challenge for us is to keep the fire burning. We've become confused in the church today about how to measure a church's success. We've gone to so many church growth seminars and maximize our potential symposiums and seeker-sensitive sessions that we believe that success in a church is buildings and bank accounts and overflow crowds. 
Let me tell you this morning, there's more to church than bodies, bucks, and buildings. The Jehovah Witnesses can build buildings. The Muslims can build buildings. If you want a crowd, go to a rock concert or a football game. They'll show you how to draw a crowd. If you want prosperity, join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They're one of the most prosperous religious bodies in the world. What I'm trying to tell you, we don't mark success by how big or beautiful a building we can build or how many people we can pack in it or what our monthly or yearly budget is. The real goal or the real mark of success for a church is does the fire of God burn in that church? That is the only mark of success. And I would ask each of you in the place where you labor, in the spot where God has planted you in his vineyard. Is the fire burning as bright there today as it burned there a year ago or two years ago or three years ago? In fact, I will ask you in your own heart, in your own life, does the fire of God burn this morning like it burned on some previous occasion? If not, you've backslidden to that extent and you need to revive the fire of God in your life today. So I want to give you some practical things this morning. Some practical things, four things on how to keep a fire burning. Now I don't have anything really profound today. If you're looking for that, wrong session. It's quite simple. Number one, if you want the fire to burn, you've got to keep fuel on it. I don't know what it is about me, but I like fire not just in the spiritual, but in the natural. I like to watch fire burn. Now, I'm not an arsonist. I don't get that carried away. But I like, there's something mesmerizing about watching a fire burn. Anybody agree with that? We lived for seven years up in Joplin, Missouri, and the wind would blow through there, and I had several trees in my yard, and the wind blow limbs out of trees, and and if you stack those things and break them up just right, eventually the city will come by and pick them up. But it seemed like such a waste of... When I could go out in the backyard and burn those things on a cool day and just watch them burn. Now, I'm not sure that was exactly legal. Sometimes... Forgiveness is easier to get than permission. I'd have a stump in the yard. I remember a tree died and eventually brought it down. I had a stump in the yard. I'd go out there and I'd burn. But you know, when you when you got a trunk of a tree, you just don't start that burning with a match. So the people that owned the house before me were kind enough to have built a tree house for their kids. And it was in somewhat of a disrepair. So piece by piece, that tree house became kindling for my backyard fires. It became the fuel for my fire. You see, you have to have some fuel if you're going to get a fire burning. And there is fuel that will burn the fire of revival. Let me tell you some things. The first one is hunger. Hunger. I remember being in Smithton, Missouri at the revival there when a lady testified one night from Wisconsin, a pastor's wife. And she said, I came into this church and she said, when I came in here at 15 till 7, there were people standing up and singing and praying and worshiping God. And I said, these people are having church before they have to. You know, we got to ring a bell and tell people it's time to start church. 
said, these people are having church before they have to. And she said, I never realized until then how unhungry I was. I don't know if that's a word or not, but you know what? It sure expresses our feeling towards God because most of us have become very unhungry. Most people in the American church have become very unhungry, but hunger is the greatest fuel of revival. We have to have hunger. You see, we have people in our churches that'll get up before Christmas at 5.30 in the morning to go down to Walmart because they've got a dozen TVs that they're going to sell for a hundred bucks and they'll stand in line at Walmart at 5.30 in the morning. We've got guys that'll crawl out of bed at four in the morning to go climb up in a tree hoping that Bambi's mom or dad's going to come somewhere in the neighborhood and yet you talk to them about getting up early and meeting God. Am I preaching yet? We're talking about hunger. You see, we come to church so full. We're full of the Super Bowl and we're full of the, the finals and we're full of the newspaper and we're full of everything but God. We're so full that God has to empty us out so we can get hungry enough to want Him. I got up early Monday morning to pray and I was sitting out on my back porch talking to the Lord and I really believe the Lord spoke to me. He doesn't speak to me all the time, but I believe it was the Lord. And the Lord said, if you will get in my presence today, my presence will get in you. Now, I had some other things to do that day, but I canceled everything else and stayed in my bedroom with worship music on all morning because, listen, there's nothing I want more than his presence in me. And if the only way to keep his presence in me is for me to keep in his presence, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord because I'm hungry for more of him. Hunger. Second thing, Fuel for revival is preparation. God may come suddenly, but he seldom comes unexpectedly. Let me repeat that. There was a great book written on the histories of the siblings of God called Suddenly from Heaven. And it makes it sound like by reading that title that God just showed up out of the blue. That never happens. God shows up where there has been human preparation for a divine intervention. We must prepare ourselves as part of the fuel of revival. In the upper room, he came suddenly, but they'd been praying for 10 days that he would come and waiting in his presence. At Topeka, Kansas, where the Pentecostal revival started, they were praying and fasting, and the man that was running that Bible college had been all across America, as far away as Maine. He'd been to A.B. Simpson's meetings and, and John Alexander Dowie's meetings. He was hungry for God. He was preparing himself. William Seymour, before the revival broke out at Azusa Street, was on a spiritual pilgrimage that led him to Houston, Texas, where he heard about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Are you listening to me right now? There must be some preparation at Brownsville, as Sister Brenda said this morning. They'd been praying for two and a half years, not just praying, but hungry for God and making pilgrimage where they heard there was revival. They said, I'm going to get over there and get some of that revival because that's the way it happens. You prepare yourself, and then God shows up. In Smithton, Missouri, Pastor Steve Gray came to Brownsville and sat in this revival for two weeks, and as he did, the glory of God came upon him. When he went back, it changed his life and changed his church forever. I'm telling you, you must prepare yourself a little bit. I don't understand people, and I run into them all the time. I know others do, and they say, well, I don't have to go to Brownsville. Well, I don't have to go to Brownsville to have revival. No, you don't. But if there is revival in Brownsville, if there's water here, who wouldn't want to go? I'm telling you, if I was living in 1906, I'd be at Azusa Street. If I had to walk or crawl on my hands and knees to get there, if God was showing up there, I'd be there. And if God shows up in your place, I'll go to your place because I'm hungry and I want to prepare myself for more of God. Prayer and fasting is the third fuel for revival. 
2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We all love to quote it, but none of us want to live it. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and answer their prayers and heal their land. The recipe for revival is there. There's no revival without prayer. And then the fourth field of revival is repentance and holiness. Write that one down and underline it. Repentance and holiness. Finney said, revival is a continued state of repentance. A continued state of repentance. Let me describe the revival in your church for you. If there is no repentance, there is no revival. If there is little repentance, there is little revival. If there is shallow repentance, there is shallow revival. But if there is great repentance, there is great revival. Repentance is the fuel of revival. You cannot ever get high enough. I don't care how many self-esteem seminars you attend. You can never get high enough to reach God. But if you can get low enough, when you get low enough, you will find him. When you repent and get in his presence. Some of us are so foolish that we believe we can get revival by telling people how great they are and how blessed they are and they leave our meetings in their same sinful condition believing that God has somehow blessed their unholy lives and go out and purchase more selfish toys and continue to live in the same life they've been living and God says the call for the church in America today is repent. Repent, get right with God. There is no revival without repentance and holiness. God's message to the church in America today is not, I'm okay, you're okay. A friend of mine, pastors in Charlotte, Mark Matthews, and I was preaching for him one time, and Mark told me he had done some repairs on one of the walls in his bathroom. And he said he painted the wall white. He always thought the bathroom was white. But when he did repairs on one wall, he painted that one wall white and he found out the other three walls weren't white. They were off white. He didn't know they were off white until he painted one of them really white. And what we need in the pulpits of America today is pastors and evangelists and men and women of God that will paint the wall white so that the people in the church can see they're not quite as white as they thought they were. And when they see the glory and the presence of God and the holiness of God, their hearts be filled with repentance. The message of the church the message of revival is a message of death and denial and cross-bearing. The olive doesn't produce oil until it is crushed and the grape does not produce wine until it is crushed and the Christian does not bear the fruits of Holy Ghost revival until we've gone through the press of God, until we have crucified ourselves in repentance and holiness. I don't know if anybody's hearing me this morning, but I'm trying to preach the truth to you today. It's the fire of revival. It must be fueled. Second thing, a revival has got to breathe. If a fire is going to burn, it's got to breathe. In the town where I grew up as a kid, a little town called Comanche, Oklahoma, we didn't have regular trash service. Now, I can remember vaguely that we had some trash service because I remember the huge ruts that the trash truck would leave in the alley. But it wasn't regular, so we had to burn our trash. Any of y'all ever burn your trash? I guess in Pensacola you'd get put in jail for that. But We had a 55-gallon drum. My daddy worked at an oil refinery, so it wasn't hard to get a 55-gallon drum. And we'd put our trash in there and we'd burn it. Man, it stunk. But if the wind got up, or if we're about to go to town, we're going to go to Duncan, go shopping. Montgomery Wards. We don't want to leave the fire burning in the barrel. It's not safe. You lit it. You put the lid on it. 55-gallon drum, come with a lid. You put the lid on it, and when you put the lid on it, you know what happens? The fire goes out. 
And that's what happens to the fire in many churches. It gets smothered because somebody puts the lid on it. The fire of God must have oxygen to burn. I remember once we were in a meeting, having a great meeting. God was moving, and the pastor got up and he said, I'm evaluating this meeting every night. And I thought, you're doing what? Most meetings have been evaluated to death. I've seen Pastor Kilpatrick evaluate this revival. I've seen him evaluate it on his face. I've seen him evaluate it on his back. I've seen him evaluate it slumped over in his chair. I cannot emphasize this enough to you. Chaplin mentioned it. Sister Brenda mentioned it. But I must say this also. Because we tried, I know I pastored 21 years, we try so hard to get in control. We work so hard to be in control. It is much more difficult once we finally get some measure of control to give it up. But if we're going to have a real revival, a real Holy Ghost move of God, we must take the lid off and give God room so that he can breathe and burn. If you're afraid to lose control, you're never going to have a real rich move of God because as Chaplin said, it's holy chaos. Guys were praying for revival in their church and the pastor put a big sign up at the front of the church, six letters, let God. That was the theme for the meeting. And they were praying every day and seeking God in this meeting. Let God, let God, let God. One day the pastor came in to pray and one of the letters had fallen off of the sign. The tape had given loose and the letter had fallen off. He looked up there and it said, let go. How? Oh, and he found out the secret of letting God is you've got to first let go. You've got to take the lid off and let the fire burn. Whew. Let me tell you the third thing. There's only four, but don't don't get don't start packing your purse yet. <laughs> don't put up your fingernail clippers yet. <laughs> If you want the fire to burn, you must protect it from non-combustibles. That just doesn't sound like a good point from an evangelist, does it? Protect it from non-combustibles. Our daughter, when she turned 13, I believe it was, I had promised her that we would have a birthday party for her at the park. Her birthday is October the 13th. I failed to figure into the equation that on October the 13th in southern Missouri, the weather could be good or it could be really bad. But you know when you say something to a kid, kids don't understand variables. When you say maybe, that means yes to a kid. And if you say yes, that really means yes. So we invited, I guess, about 50 people to Summer's birthday party. And we're out at the park, and the wind is blowing at Hurricane Gale. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. We had to tie everything down under the pavilion. And I didn't have a gas grill. I was just depending on using the little charcoal thing outside the pavilion. Not only is the wind blowing at 240 miles per hour, well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it starts raining. And I've got boxes of hamburger patties from Sam's to cook, and it's raining. What do you do when you've got 50 guests at a birthday party and a daughter that's looking forward to a great day, I put up an umbrella 
and I stood out in the rain with a big golfing umbrella over the charcoal grill and cooked hamburgers for that group in the rain. And the reason I had the umbrella is because if I let it rain on the fire, the fire would go out. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to get that one, do you? If it rains on your fire, the fire will go out. Chaplain said yesterday there were plenty of wet blankets to put wildfire out. Ain't it the truth? But if you're going to keep a fire burning, that's what this message is about, remember, maintaining the fire. If you're going to keep the fire burning, sometimes you have to protect it from those things which won't burn. Let me tell you some things that'll put a fire out. I'm telling you, they'll put a fire out quicker than water. The fire of God now I'm talking about. Pride. Pride will put out. I met a kid, used to work at a Bible college, and I met a kid that went to the Bible college, hadn't seen him in a long time. He was up in Missouri and was at Long John Silver's and he, he come in for lunch and I was glad to see him, you know, and hi, how you doing and all this kind of stuff. And what are you up to? And he said, I'm going to Nashville. It's a true story, chaplain. He said, I'm going to Nashville. I said, really, what you going to do? He said, God has called me to be famous. <laughs> now, this was a new one for me. I've heard of God calling people to humble service before, but he's the first man I ever met that God called to be famous. I haven't heard any more from him. So I'm assuming somewhere he missed the call of God. But this pride thing, you see, when we're not in revival, we're too proud to embrace people who are. When we are in revival, we're too proud to embrace people who aren't. You hear about the guy that got an award at the district meeting for being the most humble pastor in the district? They gave him the award. He started bragging about it and had to take it away from him. <laughs> Steve Hill. Steve Hill was preaching here couple months ago, and I don't remember the, his message, but he was giving away t-shirts to illustrate his message, and, and one of the things that he was illustrating was humility, and he said, now I'm not going to ask who here is a humble person, but he said, can somebody tell me if a humble person is sitting beside you, and somebody raised their hand, I don't know, that person might be here this morning, but anyway, he says, they raised, they raised they said, this is a humble person, so, so Steve said, here I want you to have this t-shirt, you're a humble person, I thought. If they were humble, they'd give it away. And then the person that they gave it to for being the most humble person would have to give it to somebody else because they'd start feeling proud of their humility. <laughs> Hello? I'm so humble, I'm proud of it. After preaching and preaching and preaching against pride, one pastor got up and he said, well, we're really proud of this. And he knew when he said it. You know, you want to carry things back? Catch it on the end of your tongue. He said, but it's a humble kind of pride. <laughs> I know people walking in that same anointing that have a humble kind of pride. I didn't tell her I was going to tell this. I hope I don't get in trouble, but our, our daughter, Summer, she's 15. She's over at the youth conference, and she's a precious girl, every daddy's dream girl, but she's on the prayer team over there. First time she's ever done this. And she's on the prayer team, and we picked her up last night, and she said, I was praying for people. And she said, people fell down. And she said, I wanted to grin so bad. She said, I knew it was God, and it wasn't me, but I just wanted to grin so bad. She said, people could tell I was trying to grin. I know they could tell I was trying to grin. And that, doesn't that describe us? 
We know it's God. We know that we're not doing it. God's doing it. But boy, it, it sure does feel good to take a little bit of the credit. Whoa. Whoa. Second thing I'll put the fire out is sin. Let me tell you something about sin. I'm talking to leaders, church leaders and pastors, men and women of God in this house, but I want to tell you something about the sin. It keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. We were over at uh, Awake America in Tulsa a few years ago, and Steve Hill had preached, and people had come up to be prayed for in repentance, and I was out helping pray for people, and, and this guy came up to me, and he said, will you please pray for me? He said, 14 years ago, I was addicted to pornography. And he said, God delivered me. Completely, wonderfully set me free. But he said, now that temptation has come back on me. And I'm being drawn. After 14 years of deliverance, I'm being drawn back into that sin. Listen, folks, the devil is a sly old fox. You can come to a revival like Brownsville, answer the invitation, lay in the floor, weep and squall and bawl and be changed by God and go home and the devil will come back to you with the very same things. You see, I know what I'm talking about. I can tell you about going into a pastor's office and asking if I could check my email and when I was traveling, checked my email, and the, our email address, the company is Softnet, and the first letter you type is S, and I typed S. And when I typed S on the pastor's computer, the memory started cranking down sites that had been visited on that computer, and the S didn't sound stand for Softnet, and it didn't stand for Son of God. It was sex sites and voyeur sites that had been visited in that pastor's office in that church. I'm talking to some men right now that you think your computer is a gift of God. You think that thing is a mouse. It's not a mouse. It's a snake. I said it's a snake, and it's leading you back into some of the very things that God has delivered you from, and I'm telling you, nothing will put the fire of God out in your life quicker. Nothing Nothing will snuff it out any faster than you get back into sin. And I'm not just talking about pornography. I'm talking about telling little white lies and fibs. Sometimes preachers can be some of the worst liars in the world. Oh, you like the way I'm preaching now, don't you? I don't care if you're lying about your income tax or if you're lying about how many people you had on Sunday morning. A lie is still a lie. And God's calling the church to holiness. And the only thing or the sure thing that will put out revival, one of the sure things is to have sin in your life. The devil will draw you back if you don't walk in holiness. Third thing is the fear of man will put out the fire of revival. When God changed me, and I, I'm just telling bits and pieces of my story, but when God changed me in Miami, Oklahoma, I came down here to Brownsville, and God did a really washing and complete work on me. And, and then I wanted to bring my wife down here and daughter, and so that January of 97, we all came down here, and on the way home, the glory of God was so in our van. It was just wonderful. I just never experienced anything like it. And, and it's just like the van was, a, was, was like a glory cloud. You know, you know the guy in Little Abner that, that used to walk around with the dark cloud over his head, the guy with all the consonants in his name. You couldn't say his name. We felt like him except it wasn't a dark cloud. It was just a glory cloud. Everywhere we walked, the glory of the Lord was. And, and we drove all the way home so we could be back at the Miami Revival on a Sunday night. And I went in there on Sunday night and John Davis preached and I don't remember what he preached but I answered the altar call and went to the front and I, I'm, I'm seeking the Lord and the spirit of God came over me and I started shaking. I'm telling you folks I, I started shaking till I thought I was going to shake my teeth out of my head and I know if I'd have been in some of your churches you'd have thrown me out because you, you thought I was, I was out of order but I, I know what I was in I was in the Holy Ghost and we better be careful sometimes. I said, we better be real careful sometimes. I'll talk about that in a minute. Just hang on to that thought. 
but I was shaken under the power of God. I was shaken hard. And here, I mean, here I am. I got a doctor's degree, and I was a president of a Bible college, and I'm laying there on the floor under a pew, just, you know, I, I'm out of control. And, and I said, God, what are you doing to me? You know, if God's going to do that, he ought to have a reason. And God said, I'm taking the fear of man out of you. Oh, glory to God. I said, oh God, shake me again today if you want to. Take some more of that junk out of me. Because as long as we walk in the fear of man, we can never have the pleasure of God. Steve Grace says in most of our churches, we're so afraid of offending somebody that the only person that gets offended in our church is God. We're so afraid to let God have his way. We're so afraid Brother Big Bucks is going to get offended and take off packing to Brother Assembly across the street. We're so afraid of that. We won't preach the truth. And the Spirit of God weeps and cries over our services. The Spirit of God is offended because we don't preach the truth. Let God deliver you this morning from the fear of man. Oh, I, I give you the same caution that Chaplin gave you yesterday. This is not an excuse for being obnoxious. It's not an excuse for being rude or cruel or hard. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about preaching the truth to your people as God wrote it in his word. The fear of man. Third, fourth thing that'll put the fire out is your attitude. Whoa. Stinking thinking will put the fire of God out in your life. If you go over to my office, I've got some plaques on my wall. God's helped me and I've earned some degrees. And you wouldn't believe it the way I carry on, but I'm a Phi Kappa Phi and a Phi Alpha Theta. And I got that stuff on my wall, but I don't have this plaque hanging on my wall. I brought this over here for you this morning. This award I got a few years ago, back before revival. It says, this is to certify that Larry E. Martin has been self-appointed cop of the universe <laughs> with all the powers and privileges therein. You see who signed it, Sister Brenda? I am proud, and I be religious. Sign this for me. You've met those guys, huh? Man, I was so proud of this certificate. I was so proud to be cop of the universe because having this certificate gave me the right to judge whether everything was of God or not. Because I was self-appointed cop of the universe, I could just watch somebody on TV, chaplain, and tell you if they were of God or not. Right. Benny Hinn, ain't no way. Right. Ain't no way. Blowing on people. <laughs> Throwing his coat over people. Uh, I figured that one out real quick. Mainly the criteria I used was if God wasn't doing it in my life, in my backslidden condition, then it couldn't be God. Whew. Rodney Howard Brown, <laughs> laughing revival, you gotta be kidding. Of course, I'd forgot about the times when I was a boy growing up in a Pentecostal church and people would get drunk in the Holy Ghost, get over in a corner and just laugh themselves silly and we'd say they was laughing in the spirit. That was different. Because that was from my file of experience. Oh, I know I'm preaching to somebody right now. Some of y'all wanting this certificate. I can tell some of y'all wanting this certificate to hang on your own wall. The Toronto blessing. 
I heard they bark like dogs up there. That can't be of God. I knew it wasn't of God. Didn't have my brand on it anyway. Ooh, dancing. Dancing. Getting out in the aisle of the church and doing a two-step. I called it the charismatic two-step when I preached against it. Now, I wasn't against dancing. You just had to have your eyes closed. And God had to get you by the nap of the neck and shake you around like this, and then it was all right to dance. Just don't get out there and do it just for God. I said the stinking thinking in my life put the fire of God out in my life. Not only did this certificate, look here, it says all powers and privileges. I not only had the ability to judge and discern what was of God and not, but I was an enforcer. <laughs> Don't you dare Think about dancing in the church I'm pastoring. Don't you dare. We'll change the music. In fact, we're pretty careful about what music we let in there anyway. I remember getting up one night. I'm the enforcer now. I got the certificate. I remember getting up one night in a youth meeting where they were all having a pretty good time. Oh, let me tell you something. When you're really miserable and your Christian experience, nothing rubs you raw than going to church and seeing people have a good time. Nothing that upsets you more I've seen people come to this revival and not even give it a chance. They just walk in the door and leave before the first service because people were having too good a time. And when you're miserable, that's the last thing you want to see. Happy people. Whoever said Christians ought to be happy when they come to church anyway? They were up singing this song. When I think of his goodness, what he's done for me, I can shout, 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 or I can dance, 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 dance. And, whoo, they were just shouting and dancing and singing. And having, I was going to say something that night. I'm the enforcer now. So they turned the pulpit to me and I said, I've got a, another verse for that song. I want to introduce you all to another song. When I think about his goodness, and what he's done for me, I want to sit, 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 sit. I said it. Some of y'all looking at me with your nose snarled up. You didn't say it, but you thought it. And if you thought it, you're just as guilty as I was for saying it. I'm talking about putting the fire out tonight. I go to church. They'd sing new songs. I'd gripe. If they put them on the overhead projector, I'd gripe about that. I'd gripe because I didn't know them, then I'd gripe because they tried to teach them to me. <laughs> I remember the first time I came down here to Brownsville, I didn't know a single song that Lindell sung that night. I'd been so far from anything like revival, I didn't know any of those songs. I didn't know a single song he sung, and, and everybody's talking about how much money everybody in the revival made, and I thought, man, they can't even afford an overhead projector. <laughs> they finally fixed that, but to those of you who came early, if you didn't know the songs, you're just out of luck, buddy. I had so much of that kind of junk in me that it put out the fire of revival. 
I got one more thing. Number four. If you want to maintain the fire, this might be the strangest thing I'm going to say to you, but it might be the most important. You must clean away the ashes from yesterday's fire. Remember what I read to you when I finally found my text? It said the priest went in every day and cleaned out the ashes because the ashes of yesterday's fire were the greatest threat to the flame that would burn today. Oh God, oh God, let me speak so clearly to these men and women that they might understand what I'm trying to say this morning. For you see, so many of us are trying to cling to yesterday's fire. So many of us are trying to cling to what God did in the past that the ashes from that fire of yesterday are smothering out what God wants to do for us today. 25, 30 years ago, I had the fire of God on my life. I, I, I was fired up. Amen. I had the fire of God. But things happened to me. Everybody say things happen. Things happen. Boy, they do. Things happen. And I got run over a few times. You know, a toad that's been run over by a wagon wheel can relate to another toad run over by a wagon wheel. Especially when the wagon backs up and hits you again. <laughs> and I went through some stuff. And I began to change my focus. I didn't do it on purpose. But looking back on it, I know what I was doing. I was looking for something that, like everybody else, I was mad at people. And I was looking for something that people couldn't take away from me. So I started chasing other things. Education, denomination, affiliation, reputation. I remember as clear as day, an evangelist was sitting in my office. I could see it right where we were sitting my office one day and he said yep he said I know a preacher as I was going for my education he said I know a preacher got his master's degree lost the fire of God and I'm thinking you fool that ain't gonna happen to me but I started chasing and I'd sit in seminary Pentecostal seminary and they'd tell me the Bible's not really the word of God it just contains the Word of God. And then one by one go through the miracles. All oh, that children of Israel out there in the wilderness, that wasn't really manna. That wasn't something God gave. That was on a, grew on a plant out there. And that snake that bit Paul, that wasn't a poisonous snake. There never were any poisonous snakes on Malta. Oh, there's no such thing as an anointing to preach. Yeah, I was told that in Pentecostal seminary. There's no such thing as an anointing to preach. It's only pulpit antics. Chip, chip. And then I got over into a denominational seminary where we never even opened a Bible. The Bible wasn't relevant to that place. I was their token Pentecostal. On the other side of the class, there was the token homosexual pastor of the Metropolitan Community Church. Another guy's in the class, he doesn't even believe in God. He's pastor in church, but he doesn't believe in God. First time in my life. I was raised really sheltered. First time in my life that I ever went out to eat with a group of people, and everyone at the table ordered beer but me, was in seminary with a group of pastors. And I just kept getting further and further and further until finally I had so much junk in me. Let's make it plain. I had so much sin in me. I was still a Pentecostal preacher. I was still ordained. I was still working for God. Hello. 
I was still working for God, but I had no relationship with God. I had a relationship with the ministry, but I had no relationship with God. I'd get in in a panic on Saturday night and pray for a sermon, but that's about all the praying I did. Maybe bless my food. I may be speaking exactly to somebody here this morning. I was a mess. I tell folks that my spiritual life was on life support. Jack Kevorkian was my attending physician. <laughs> Religion was ready to pull the plug and the devil was standing by to tag my toe. I was just about gone. And I would, I would miss the fire. You know, once you've had it, you miss it. Didn't want to pay the price to get it, but I missed it. And I was thinking, how do I get the fire back? And I would think about when I was a kid growing up, we sung all these songs, camping in Canaan's land, and I'll fly away. And the church where I pastored, we'd been right on the cutting edge at that time. We'd singing the newest songs that came out. And I said, Sunday night, we're going to do away with all these courses. We're going to get the hymn book out. And if we couldn't find hymns that were old enough, if I'm lying, I'm dying. If we couldn't get hymns that were old enough in our book, I had these old, old hymn books. I'd go photocopy pages out of these old, old hymn books so we could meet in the morning and meet in the air and keep on the firing line because I was looking back where the fire was, thinking I could go back and find God. I was a mess, but I knew I was a mess. And I, was, I wanted something different, but I was going backwards. I was digging through the ashes of yesterday's fire. Digging through the old remains, looking for an ember, and there was nothing there. The more we sung old dead songs, the deader it got. <coughs> were hurting. October the 22nd, 1996. Well, let me tell you this first. Back when I'd burned that stuff in my backyard, my kids had pretty well grown up, but they had this Frisbee that they played with. And they left the Frisbee they left the Frisbee out in the backyard. And it was up under that tree house. And I just left it there. This isn't it, but I just left it there. And when I was burning that fire, to get a big log on the fire, you know what I'm talking about. It would burn for a while, and then it would get gray. All the brush had been piled up on it, burn up, and it would get gray with ash. And I would walk over there to that fire with that old Frisbee. It worked perfect. And I would just stand over the fire and I'd do this. When I did, there'd be a little smoke of ashes that would start scattering. And the more I waved, I'd see something red. You've done this too. Maybe you was smart enough not to do it with a Frisbee, but you've done it. And the more I'd wave, pretty soon it would just get bright red. And then out of nowhere, off of that log, there'd be a flame. A flame would pop up. Just keep fanning it. Keep fanning it. Keep fanning it. And pretty soon it was blazing again. Just keep fanning it. You know what I had to do? I had to blow away all the ashes. I had to blow away all the ashes from yesterday's fire. And then it would burn fresh. October the 22nd. 1996, we had a speaker at our chapel at the college that morning, and I took him out to eat. We're sitting at the restaurant, and he says, what do you think about that Brownsville revival? And my exact words were, I'm a skeptic. I said, I have the gift of skepticism. <laughs> there it is, proof. I had the gift of skepticism. He felt the same way I did. We 
we didn't talk bad about the revival. We just didn't know if it was of God or not. Well, that very day, a friend of mine, in fact, is in the hospital this morning praying for him, but a friend of mine had called me and he said, John Davis in revival down in Miami, Oklahoma. So let's, let's go down and hear him. Well, I didn't particularly want to go hear John. I like John. He's a friend of mine, but I didn't care about going to revival. Listen, we didn't even care about going to church. <laughs> I'm an ordained preacher sitting on the general board of my denomination. I didn't care if I went to church or not. We, we'd long since quit going on Wednesday night, and then Sunday night it dropped out, and we'd go on Sunday morning to the place we knew we'd get out first, where the preacher we knew would be through preaching at 1130. That's the church we went to. Am I telling the truth? That's where we wanted to go. I didn't care about going to hear John, but this friend of mine was driving 200 miles, 250 miles to come up there to hear John preach. And I thought, well, if he drive 250 miles, I could drive 25 to see him. So I drove down to Miami, Oklahoma, and John Davis preached. I don't know what he preached, but he come up the aisle. Well, it was right over here. He come right up the aisle in that church. And I was sitting down. I didn't even get up to get prayed for. I was just sitting there, and he came up behind me and snuck up on me. and laid his hands on me and prayed for me. And what he did, brother, it was just like that. It was just like God took a fan and blew away all of those ashes, all of those dead embers for years. I was so dead and so dry and so full of junk, I didn't really know if God could ever do it again. I'm telling you the truth. I was ready to quit the ministry. I had a newspaper article in my car an ad where I was going to go look for a job at a secular college because I was sick of preaching and I was sick of people and I was sick of churches and I was sick of religion and I was sick of denominations. I had had it with everything. But God came down that night in a miraculous way and blew the dust and the ashes away and found a fire that was still somewhere down in me and set it aflame. And ever since that day, glory to God, I've been fanning the fire. I've been putting fuel on it. I've been keeping it safe from combustibles because I don't want the fire to go out. <laughs> I'll tell you this, I probably shouldn't, but I will. I will not allow this fire to go out. Last semester at the school, not this past one, but the one before, I got so busy with stuff. Man, I hate to get busy with stuff. Pastors, you get so busy with stuff. I know what it is. I've pastored. The phone rings. You say, I'm going to pray at this time, but the phone rings. You've got to run off to the hospital. You've got to do something else. And the time you're going to pray, you don't pray. You end up, you go the whole week and you haven't prayed. I got so full of stuff. Busy stuff. Good stuff, but busy stuff. I felt like God was jealous. I felt like God was jealous. And I talked to pastor and talked to chaplain. I said, I, I don't know if I can stay here another semester. I may have to leave. I may have to go because I've got to go after the fire of God. Now, I've changed my schedule this last semester and spent a whole lot more time in the presence of the Lord and, and God renewed me and refreshed me. But I want to tell you something. I'm happy. I'm the happiest man in the world to be at Brownsville. I told you I'm the most blessed person in the world. But if busyness or junk or anything else will get between me and God, I'm telling you what, I'm out of any place because there's nothing more important in my life than the grace and glory of God. I hope I can stay here in the rest of my life and enjoy this church and enjoy this school and enjoy this revival. I, I hope that I can have enough wisdom not to fall back into the traps that I was in before. But I'm I'm telling you, there's nothing more important in my life or your life than maintaining the fire of God. You must, I said, you absolutely must keep the fire burning. It must burn day and night. It must not go out. Shoo. Now, I know this is a teaching session this morning, and I've preached a whole lot. Man, I'd a lot rather preach than teach. No, I'm through. But I'm going to give an altar call right now. I believe I've spoke to some people in here. No, I haven't spoke to you. God has. God doesn't even need my words to speak to you. But I believe God's spoken to some men and women in this room today. And I believe there's some of you here that's got some junk in your life that's putting the fire out. And you know it. I don't, I'm not here to condemn you. 
my, 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 I'm the last person in the world to ever put a, point a finger at anybody. My life was such a mess. How could I ever point a finger at anybody? I'm just telling you, you're here this morning and junk has come in and, and maybe you're not living in sin, but yet you know you're not living where you need to be close to God so that the fire is protected and burning and you're not putting the fuel on the fire and the fire has died out in your heart. I'm not saying it's gone out. I'm just saying it's died down and you need, whew, you need God the Holy Ghost. Whew. Yeah, some of you are living in yesterday's fire. Some of you are looking for, you're, you're here praying that God will send you a Father's Day 1995 at your church. Let me tell you this morning, you don't need a Father's Day 95. You don't need a Brownsville revival. You don't need a Toronto revival. You don't need an Argentina revival. You need the God of revival. And if you'll go after the God of revival, he'll send a fresh fire to your congregation. <laughs> Bow your heads, please. We don't always do this at Brownsville, but I want to do it this morning. Your heads are bowed all across this room. I wonder who's here and you'd say, Preacher, you spoke to me this morning. God spoke to me through the word that you spoke. There is ashes from yesterday. There's ashes from the former fire that's smothering out the fire in my life. And I need God to show me that I can't find God in the past. I've got to find him in the now. And you'd say, Pray for me. Lift your hand up right now. God bless you, men and women all over the house. All right, you can put your hands down. Now I want to ask you this next question, and this is, boy, I mean, this is where the rubber meets the, meets the road, men of God. I can remember how hard it was for me as a Bible college president, a member of my general board, ordained preacher, to answer an altar call when John Davis said, who's got sin in your life? And I went down to that altar and made it right with God, and I'm so glad I did. I didn't go once. I went night after night after night as God cleansed me. And I believe there's somebody here, and you say, there's junk in my life. There's sin in my life. I'm not going to embarrass you, Pastor. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want to pray for you right now. You say, I need to get it right with God. Church leader, lift your hand up. Say, pray for me. Thank you. All over the building. All over the building. Let's stand together right now. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we need the fire of God. Lord, we don't need more programs. We don't need more techniques. We don't need more symposiums or seminars or sessions. We need the fire of God, Lord. We need the fire of God. Lord, there's men and women in this house that said there's sin in my life. I pray that as we give this invitation, Lord, that they'll ask you to forgive them, that they'll come right before you and walk in holiness. God, there's some in this house that have said the fire has flickered and almost gone out in their life. I pray, God, that you'll restore the fire of God in their lives. I ask it now in Jesus' name. Blow across the ashes of yesterday's fire and send a fresh flame. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. Now, if you lifted your hand a moment ago for whatever reason, I want you to come fill the front of this building right now. Come on, come on, come on. Right behind these that are coming. If you're in this house and you want the fire of God on your life, you come in behind these. Come on, let's fill up this place. Let's have a prayer meeting right now. Let's ask God.
Fit to live or die. 